Welcome to today's webinar on female sexual health history and screening, the first of a three-part series. I'm Jessica Monmany, a program manager at ARHP, and I'll be serving as your moderator today. Before we get started on our content, I have a few announcements to make. To receive continuing education credit for this activity, you must take the pre- and post-test. If you have not yet taken the pre-test and you are viewing this webinar live, you will find the pre-test link in your reminder email and the post-test link will be sent to you after the webinar. If you are viewing this webinar on demand, both the pre- and post-test links can be found below this video. In the webinar dashboard, you should see a chat box that you can use to enter questions throughout the webinar, which our faculty will answer at the end. In four weeks, you will receive an email from ARHP's Education Department with a link to a follow-up evaluation. We ask that you complete this evaluation to let us know how you've incorporated what you learned during this webinar into your work. Completing the pre- and post-test, as well as this follow-up evaluation, helps ARHP ensure that we continue to meet your educational needs and interests. Thank you in advance for your time and feedback. ARHP would like to acknowledge that today's webinar was made possible through an independent educational grant from Valiant. On this slide, you'll see the planning committee disclosures. As you can see, none of our planning committee members or faculty have anything to disclose. And on the next slide, you will see the learning objectives for today's webinar. By the end of our hour together, we hope you will be able to describe three models of female sexual response, summarize the diagnostic criteria for female sexual dysfunctions, or FSDs, with a focus on hypoactive sexual de desire disorder, or HSDD, describe effective approaches for discussing sexual health with patients, and identify screening tools. At this time, I would like to introduce our faculty, Dr. Nara Spenfield and Don Downing. Nara Spenfield is an assistant professor and the director of family planning and the fellowship in family planning. She completed her undergraduate degree at Harvard University and her medical training and family planning fellowship at the University of California, San Francisco, and her master's of public health at the University of California, Berkeley. Dr. Benfield's research interests include the integration of contraceptive counseling, access, and distribution into medical care for high-risk women both domestically and internationally, urogenital fistula, and clinical training and health technologies in low-resource settings. Don Downing is a clinical professor at the University of Washington School of Pharmacy in Seattle and endowed chair of the Institute for Innovative Pharmacy Practice. He and his colleagues developed the country's first pharmacist-initiated contraception, emergency contraception, and immunization program. In 2014, Don was presented with the 2014 Felicia Stewart Award for Lifetime Achievement by the American Society for Emergency Contraception and the International Consortium for Emergency Contraception for efforts to increase access to emergency contraception. We're thrilled to have both of them with us today, and without further ado, I'll hand it over to Nara. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Uh, we're going to start by uh, exploring the definition of sexual health and the models that can help us understand the female sexual response. So how is sexual health defined? The World Health Organization defines it as a state of physical, emotional, mental, and social well-being in relation to sexuality not merely the absence of disease, dysfunction, or infirmity. And in order to achieve that, it's also further defined as requiring a positive and respectful approach to sexuality and sexual relationships, and the possibility of having pleasurable and safe sexual experiences free of coercion, discrimination, and violence. There are three key elements to sexual health. As we can see, this is a um, expansive definition, which it needs to be. And the three key elements are, number one, the capacity to enjoy and control sexual and reproductive behavior in accordance with your personal and social ethic. Number two is freedom from fear, shame, guilt, false beliefs, and other psychological factors that inhibit the sexual response and impair sexual relationships. And the third thing is the freedom from organic disorders, diseases, and deficiencies that interfere with sexual and reproductive functioning. Aligned with that expansive definition is understanding the female sexual response 
through a variety of models that take into consideration these uh, different aspects of what you need to achieve sexual health. The three models we're going to talk about today are the biopsychosocial model, the linear model, and the circular model. The biopsychosocial model it integrates multiple factors and determinants that form a part of sexual health. We're looking at biologic factors. This is your physical health. This is your endocrine function. This is your neurobiology. We're looking at psychological factors. We're looking at psychological disorders such as depression and anxiety, um, <clears throat> as well as performance concerns, etc. We're looking at social cultural factors such as your cultural norms and expectations, um, you know, what is the sexual health norms that exist within your particular community. And then we're looking at you individually and your interpersonal experiences, your experiences in current relationships, in past relationships, what else is going on in your life, life stressors, financial stress, all of these things integrate into adequate sexual health. And the biopsychosocial model emphasizes that integration and emphasizes the fact that all four of these components are essential for healthy sexual response. Getting down more into the specifics of the actual physical sexual response in women, we were looking at the linear model. The linear model shows us three phases, excitement, getting ready, and this phase can last for a few minutes, this can last for many hours. This is kind of your uh, preparatory phase and is characterized by a variety of physical changes that prepare a woman's body for orgasm. Then we enter into the plateau phase, which is an intensification and um, a moment time when you're sustaining these changes that were begun during the excitement phase, leading you all the way up to the brink of orgasm. Orgasm then becomes the peak of sexual excitement and starts the reversal of the changes that physiological changes that began during the excitement phase, which finally then ends in resolution when the body returns to its normal state. And there are a variety of ways that women can pass through the linear model. These could be three different women. This could be the same woman and three different experiences. Rapid excitement, sustained plateau, orgasm, couple orgasms and resolution. We have rapid excitement that travels quickly to orgasm with quick resolution, model C. That tends to be a model that uh, is more associated with masturbation. Uh, or pattern B, where there's excitement and there's plateau and maybe there is no orgasm. That's not necessarily um, dysfunctional, as long as that's not what occurs every time. Then we want to look at the circular model. The circular model is, I think, kind of midway between the linear, which really just focuses on the process of excitement, orgasm, and resolution and the biopsychosocial, which focuses really on the whole person's milieu. The circular model thinks about, for a particular instance of um, sex, with a sexual response, how do we incorporate the motivation for sex? Some of which is sexual pleasure, some of which is emotional intimacy, relationship satisfaction. This model helps us understand that there are a variety of motivations for sex and helps us think about the different uh, ways that desire is developed. So one of the um, sort of sexual dysfunction disorders that we will be talking about is hypoactive sexual desire disorder, HSDD. There's a little bit of a controversy on the nomenclature of HSDD right now because in the uh, DSM-IV, 
HSDD was noted to be a separate uh, entity from female arousal disorder. In DSM-5, those have been combined as female sexual interest and arousal disorder. And, you know, I think that um, allowing them to be distinct diagnoses gives us more of a framework for ways to categorize women's sexual health concerns. And separate naming systems have been developed by the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health that I think give us a richer palette in, when we're looking to define uh, female sexual disorders. So we're gonna define them. This is codes and definitions from the DSM-4. And it makes sense, I think, the way that they um, categorize them as desire disorders which include hypoactive sexual desire disorder, which is absence or deficiency of sexual interest or desire, and sexual aversion disorder, which is aversion to and avoidance of genital contact with a sexual partner. Then we're thinking about sexual arousal disorders. The desire is there, but the arousal is problematic. Female sexual arousal disorders is the inability to attain or maintain adequate lubrication and that excitement response that we talked about in the linear model. Then there's orgasmic disorders, which is the delay or absence of orgasm. So the desire is there, the arousal is there, but the orgasm is problematic. And then finally, we have disorders related to sexual health that are more around pain, which is your classic dyspareunia, pain associated with sexual intercourse. Further, we want to be able to enhance these definitions by understanding what is the time frame that women are experiencing this. Do we categorize this as lifelong, something that's been present since the onset of sexual functioning? Is this acquired? It was normal before and now it's not. Is this situational? Some Sometimes it's normal, but in certain types of situation or with certain types of stimulation or with particular partners, one of these problems arises. And is, or is it generalized? So lifelong versus acquired and situ situational versus generalized. It's also important to make sure that these diagnoses meet the criteria of a true disorder. So this is not a single instance of this occurring, right? We showed in the linear model, excitement and plateau and resolution without orgasm can be a normal sexual experience, um, as long as it's not persistent. So in order to get the diagnosis of a disorder, we wanna make sure that this is something that's persistent or recurrent. We also want to make sure that this is something that is causing personal distress. We also need to make sure that there is not another condition that is clearly accounting for this diagnosis. So if this, if someone has uh, decreased sexual desire, but relates it directly to their active depression, then depression is the primary issue that we wanna be addressing. And finally, that it's not due exclusively to the direct physiologic effects of a substance or a medication. And as we talk through going through the sexual history and how to ask patients about um, sexual dysfunction, we'll be able to parse out some of these characteristics. <clears throat> the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health this is the way that they lay out their nomenclature. So a little bit different than the DSM-4, but similarly segregating it into desire, arousal, and orgasm. Within sexual desire, we're looking at hyperactive sexual desire disorder, HSDD. And they are giving a little more detail to say lack of motivation for sexual activity or loss of desire for at least six months. And this is gonna be, when we think of desire, this is gonna be sort of spontaneous desire, you know, sexual fantasies, thoughts, or this is gonna be desire in response to cues or stimulation. 
Then they're looking at arousal disorders and they're categorizing it as female genital arousal disorder versus persistent genital arousal disorder. One is for at least six months, the inability to develop or maintain the adequate genital response. The other one is not only not getting the response, but actually having distressing feelings around being aroused. So that you can see how those are a little bit different, not getting the response versus maybe being physically excited, but psychologically having significant challenges with that feeling. And then finally, orgasmic disorders, which uh, is female orgasmic disorders or female orgasmic illness syndrome. So female orgasmic disorders, persistent or recurrent distressing compromise of orgasm frequency, intensity or timing, and or pleasure associated with sexual activity versus female orgasmic illness syndrome, which is peripheral and or central aversive symptoms that occur before, during, or after orgasm. And the etiology of these can be a little bit different. Um, and you're gonna want to get into the details of the orgasmic experience with the patient to figure out how best to define it and therefore to figure out how best to address it. So um, are there any questions or should we have Don take over focusing more specifically on disorders of desire? I'll go ahead and take over here, Neris. Thank you. The um, by the way, um, um, you, some, some listeners may be um, uh, interested in knowing why a pharmacist is doing this section. Um, I, I felt that it's probably best to give you some background. Um, I, um, I, I've worked a lot in uh, tribal healthcare clinics and also in community settings with private counseling rooms for men and women. And I began uh, hearing from a lot of women about uh, many of these disorders uh, in, when, in the context of medications. It's led me to work with uh, physicians to improve um, uh, pharmacists' ability to provide a welcoming environment for people to discuss these issues. And uh, here we are today, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so uh, first of all is uh, definitions and um, Neris has, has uh, spoken quite well about some of these, but I'm going to review them again. Um, so um, I'll use HSDD, uh, maybe a primary or secondary to another condition. It's uh, maybe lifelong or acquired, generalized or situational. It includes either lack of motivation for sexual activity, evidenced as either reduced or absent spontaneous desire, which would be sexual thoughts or fantasies, or reduced or absent responsive desire to erotic cues and stimulation, or inability to maintain desire or interest through sexual activity, or loss of desire to initiate or participate in sexual activity, including uh, behavioral responses such as avoidance of situations that could lead to sexual activity. That is, that sexual activity that is not, uh, but it's not secondary to sexual pain disorders and is combined with clinically significant personal distress, as Neris mentioned. Um, people may have uh, low desire but not be distressed and, and wouldn't fit this definition. Um, but that distress may include frustration, grief, incompetence, loss, sadness, sorrow or worry and this represents a change for at least three months from the previous state if you will normal state um, personal distress is a prerequisite for hsdd diagnosis on this slide um, 
I, I want to explain these columns here. It's um, the prevalence of female sexual problems associated with distress and determinants of uh, uh, treatment seeking uh, from the PRESIDE study. It's a cross-sectional population-based survey of 31,500 uh, U.S. females 18 years of age and older in the United States. The prevalence of female sexual problems uh, associated with distress is uh, low desire at 38.7%. Uh, second column is arousal, low arousal at 26%, 25, 26%. Orgasm difficulties uh, uh, around 21%, and the prevalence of any sexual problem was 43 to 44%. Low desire was the most common of these three problems among all age groups. However, there was a marked increase in prevalence with age. Only 27% of women aged 18 to 44 reported any of the three problems compared with 44% of women aged 45 to 64. And finally, 80% uh, of women aged 65 and older reported um, these, any of these three problems. Although while the prevalence of any self-reported sexual problem was 43%, the prevalence of reported complaints plus personal distress about the problems was just 12%. Okay, so um, low desire associated with adverse outcomes. Those adverse outcomes include lower health-related quality of life, uh, dissatisfaction with sex life, uh, partner or marriage, frustration, hopelessness, anger, poor self-esteem, loss of femininity, uh, and sometimes resulting in a divorce and lower social economic status. Sexual activity and age. This comes from the uh, MIDAS II uh, study, Survey of Midlife Development in the United States. Um, the survey included more than 2,100 women aged 28 to 84. About 60% of married cohabitating women aged 60 years and older were sexually active. Uh, the non-sexually active mean age was 62, but the sexually active mean age was 52. Romantic partner status. Uh, was the best predictor of whether one was sexually active, regardless of age, even for women in their 70s and 80s. So um, having a romantic uh, partner um, was very predictive uh, for sexual activity. Sexual active women still sexually satisfied, uh, were found to be sexually satisfied regardless of age or menopause status. Among sexually active women, uh, Sexually, uh, sexual satisfaction related to, as you see here, uh, relationship satisfaction, uh, better communication, higher importance of sex, but it's not related to age. Move on. Oops, move back. Here we go. So, um, um, I didn't develop this slide, but but for me, um, this is um, this slide works well as as a provider discussing these issues with women in terms of what um, from from this same study that was on the previous slide, a frequent frequency of sexual activity in older women um, shows um, what might be considered norms, and people often ask. Is, is my desire and frequently, uh, frequency of sex normal or abnormal? And I think this slide does a nice job of, of uh, at least from this study, what, what norms were. And as you might, might suspect, um, 
um, the sexual activity in older women age category uh, was decreased uh, but not absent and um, it just um, at least once a, once a month um, sexual activity or uh, less than once a month we're increasing in older women but certainly not absent. All right and um, so um, we touched on this earlier, but um, there are certainly psychological contributions to this disorder. Uh, mood, uh, be, you know, behavioral health, uh, depression, irritability, um, rage, um, um, uh, fear, shame, embarrassment, um, and anxiety, sexual self-confidence. Um, um, sleep disturbances, uh, decreases in psychological resilience, which could be a topic of its own. Um, developmental issues, um, which is often in, 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 in populations that I've, I've worked with in, um, in at-risk populations with low access to healthcare services and uh, often low income, um, I found a lot of issues of developmental uh, lots of examples of it that we dealt with, including trauma. And in some of my uh, uh, groups, it's kind of historical trauma, especially with Native American tribes. Abuse, impact of childhood illness or surgery, divorce, affairs, abandonment, uh, resulting in lack of trust, um, and, uh, and certainly body image. So um, chronic um, uh, interpersonal issues include chronic discord. So uh, emotional estrangement, as you might imagine, uh, disappointment. Um, uh, I like the term ghosts of past relationships. So past relationships gone awry, uh, causing a fear of making oneself vulnerable. Um, uh, maybe also resulting in negative expectations about sexual activity. Um, uh, sexual partner problems uh, in males, erectile dysfunction, rapid ejaculation, or low or discrepant uh, desire. Uh, discrepant desire, if this um, is a term you haven't used, is the uh, difference between one's desired frequently of sexual intercourse and the actual frequency of sexual intercourse within a relationship. Um, and uh, sexually maladroit partners, uh, partner psychiatric illness. Therefore, the, um, the predictability of, a, um, of a, a romantic sexual partner is, um, comes to bear here, uh, including partners with addiction and depression. So um, I know it... Um, these charts sometimes um, um, get confusing and um, um, are maybe more useful when you go back and look at them, but, but certainly uh, chronic medical conditions um, affecting sexual health is, is really the reason um, that, that drew me into this arena to begin with, um, as I had many women who were uh, perhaps intimidated to tell their doctor about some of their issues, but when, when I sat down with them as a pharmacist, um, I, I could only guess the reasons why they opened up, other than the fact that we weren't having these conversations at a pharmacy counter. These were in private rooms aside, and if there are pharmacists listening in, um, I need to tell you, you cannot have these conversations at the counter because it just won't get started. But I, um, I ran into a lot of women who are having um, issues um, with depression who then took medications for their depression and their sexual desire um, decreased even more. And, um, and, and in fact, that's not uncommon and we'll, we'll show some of those medications. But and I also just, I, yeah, I also just wanted to put you back on what Don was saying and I think that we're also going to talk about this a lot more when we discuss treatment more thoroughly in subsequent seminars because sometimes this can be a challenge. Depression as a contributing factor to sexual dysfunction as well as medications for depression contributing. So really being able to find something that works for the individual patient can take a lot of uh, finesse and skill. 
Yeah, thank you. That's right. We're, we're not going to spend a lot of time here. These are mostly self-explanatory and we've discussed in our dialogue. But we, um, but um, I, I have to tell you that um, we, we uh, working in a, in a medical clinic where uh, many of uh, our providers switch women to new um, SSRI antidepressants, which early on uh, did not list uh, decreased sexual desire as a side effect, and so they were switched for that reason. If you'll notice, you'll notice that all of them include those now, and those were the primarily the women that I saw that um, were switched because of low sexual desire to these drugs who found they had uh, increased uh, uh, difficulties. So, um, so uh, just, just briefly, because we'll talk about these more in further webinars, medical conditions that affect sexual health, uh, certainly endocrine disorders, diabetes, thyroid conditions, neurological disorders, uh, cardiovascular disease, especially um, what I see is often undiagnosed um, hypertension or type 2 diabetes or dyslipidemias that um, may be chronic um, but undiagnosed and therefore untreated um, and, and uh, psychiatric conditions that we as we have mentioned previously and um, so uh, again just a brief note here of um, of uh, many of the medications and, and uh, that, that could cause um, sexual side effects. Um, for those who, um, who are um, not specialists in this field under hormones, you see GnRH um, uh, agonists. Um, so these are gonadotropin releasing hormone um, uh, agonists and, um, and could be uh, antagonists also. So, but we'll get into these later. All right. Um, so, screening and evaluation of. Um, I think it's uh, it's back please, to I me. Think hand over to you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, sounds good. So, you know, I am an obstetrician gynecologist. Uh, a lot of my practice is talking to women about reproductive health, about contraception, and even I find it sometimes difficult to do an appropriate screening for sexual dysfunction. And yet we saw from the uh, study that, that Don showed us that these issues are prevalent, right? And they affect women across the age spectrum. So it's very important that we ask because if you don't ask, you don't know. And of course, with something this private and this intimate, oftentimes patients will have difficulty bringing it up themselves. So the number one thing is to open the conversation for them. And we're gonna take you through some ways to do that. The first thing you want to do is you want to normalize conversations about sexual health. This is the door opening question. So you're going to start with ways, questions that are going to allow women to feel as though this is something that they can address because this is a normal part of um, a normal challenge that many women have. So something like many women with diabetes have sexual problems. How about you? Many women uh, after menopause can have sexual problems. Many women on these medications can feel that it affects their sexual health. What's your situation? Opening the door is the first step. Then you want to, if they say, oh no, no problems, great, you've, you've screened them, wonderful. If then they say, yes, I am actually having issues, then we wanna drill down into what are the specifics of those issues. So we want to think about what effect it's having on their life. So I like to say, are you having issues, number one, and then how is it affecting your life or your relationship? Because that's gonna help us in that, those second criteria for actually diagnosing a disorder, which is that it has to cause personal distress. If they say, oh, occasionally, but doesn't really have any detrimental effect on me, 
then maybe I, we don't need to delve any further. But if we do need to delve further, then we want to go into more specific questions. Again, I like to keep it open-ended at the beginning. After that, just asking them, can you describe your sexual problem? That gives them the opportunity to describe what it might be from their personal experience. Then we can focus on the specifics of inquiring as to try and parse out, is this um, with desire? Is it arousal based? Is it orgasm based? Is there physical conditions that have an implication? Dyspareunia, lubrication, dryness, specifically focusing on orgasm itself. So we can look at the orgasmic disorders. And then if that question of tell me what about your sexual problems seems like that's not getting at it, tell me about your typical sexual experience is another nice open-ended entry to get them to define, self-define what their issues is. Again, giving you some like nuts and bolts, here's what to say. We talked about the open-ended question to begin with, normalizing the problem, universalizing the screening. So I would say, is it, it's part of my routine to ask about sexual health as part of the well woman visit. Tell me about any sexual concern problem issue you may be having or normal, you know, it's common among women with diabetes to have sexual problems, etc. That second screening question, is it affecting your life? How do you think this may be affecting your relationship? or your life in general, then asking them to describe your sexual problem or describe your typical sexual experience. And then what distresses them most about that sexual problem. Oh, I'm sorry. I slacked on the advanced slides. Here we go. All right. Then I want to get into more detail. So now I've, I've screened, I've done sort of my universal screening. I've elicited if it is potentially a true disorder or if it's something that really is not having a significant impact on their life. Now I've gotten more details about the specifics of it and more details about the most distressing aspect of it. Now we want to think about what are some of those other factors that are playing into this disorder? What have you tried to manage the problem so far? It's going to give me an idea of what things they've tried, what things we can talk about. Are there any medical conditions that are affecting your quality of life or your sexual health? That's going to give us an idea of what sort of investigations we might need or want to do. And I like the, what would a successful resolution of your sexual problems look like? Because every woman's sexual goals can be different and every woman's idea of what is a healthy sexual experience can be different. So I don't want to impose what I think they should be having on them. Asking them what would a resolution of this problem looks like allows you then to tailor your focus to what their particular goals are. And we're again thinking of that large model of all the things that play into sexual health. What have you talked to your partner about? Is gonna be very important to know where to start. You may, these are some of these, most of these are open-ended questions, but you may also wanna consider asking some specific closed-ended questions that need to give you a direct answer like, do you have pain with intercourse? If you do, at what point does this pain happen? Where does it happen? And if you are asking these open-ended questions and you're getting kind of a vague response, you have to drill down further, right? Tell me more. What do you mean by that? Encouraging them to talk in more detail. If people are using euphemistic terms, don't be afraid to ask for clarification of those terms, getting more detail uh, is going to be very important for you to know how to address the issue.
taking a thorough sexual history is a critical part of the evaluation process. You're going to need to know all of these things because as we've seen, all of these things contribute to sexual health. What are medical issues that they have currently and previously? What medications are they taking? What's their reproductive health and their current reproductive status? Menstrual history, obstetrical history, any infertility issues, contraception use, sexually transmitted infection history, any gynecologic problems, surgeries, any urologic problems, any one of these issues can have an impact on sexual function. You know, if you have dysmenorrhea and menorrhagia and you're bleeding for two weeks out of the month, that's impacting your sexual health for sure, right? If you are engaged in an infertility workup and you, you know, you're, you're getting this psychological focus on sex as a means to fertility, that can impact your sexual health. If you've had previous urogenital surgery and you're having any discomforts, that can impact your sexual health. So it's very important to take a close reproductive um, and gynecologic history. General surgical history as well, right? I mean, th thinking even of things as though I had a hip replaced, my ability for positioning is challenged and how does that affect my sexual health? Chronic illnesses, as we, as Don talked about, endocrine conditions, neurologic conditions, high blood pressure, psychiatric illnesses, these are common things which are treated with common medications that can have an impact on sexual health and certainly substance use as well. Then we must include the psychosocial screening as part of our thorough sexual history. What's current relationship status? We saw that was the number one predictive factor for sexual frequency and that's going to be important to know. What is a woman's fertility intentions? Again, women in a uh, actively seeking pregnancy, sex may take on a different meaning than it does for women who are engaging in sex for non-conception uh, reasons. Any history of abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, also emotional and verbal abuse is going to be very important and a sexual history, age of, um, you know, uh, <coughs> initiation of sex, sexual history, number of partners, these things, ex experience with previous partners, these things are gonna be uh, important as well. There's a nice model called the PLIST, <laughs> PLICIT, sorry, model. Um, which is a helpful tool for discussing sexual health or concerns with patients. <clears throat> and this is sort of the way that we've structured out the questions. Number one, giving permission, opening the door to talk about the issues, asking open-ended questions during a routine history to give the patient permission to talk about her sexual concern and reassure her that her feelings are normal and acceptable. And then once you open the door, following up on their response. The second one is providing limited information. So giving them a little bit of information about the sexual response, the etiology of sexual problems potentially, normal changes in sexual function throughout the life cycle, as we said. <coughs> As we age, maybe sexual frequency becomes less, but sexual desire tends to remain or change. All of these things can happen. Orgasm every time is not expected, is not normal, but none of the time is certainly not typical either. And the amount of this that you do is really going to depend on the patient in front of you and on the amount of time you have. Do not hesitate to schedule a follow-up visit if there are further details that you need to go into. Then we want to offer specific suggestions. So now we're going to get more into the treatment phase. So we've opened the door to screen, 
we've gotten more detailed information as we've shared detailed information about what's normal and what's not. Now we have some specific suggestions for <coughs> our patient about first passes to address the issue. Is there physical issues, postmenopausal, vaginal dryness? Can we talk about lubrication? Can we talk about topical estrogen? Uh, can we um, talk about if it's more relationship-based? Can we talk about date nights? Can we talk about prioritizing sex? If there's other medical conditions that are contributing, can we figure out how to improve those as well, improving sleep and diet, and, uh, et cetera? And then there's intensive therapy, which would be the next phase of treatment where we might actually think about referring patients to sexual specialists. There are some tools that exist to help us with this screening. Certainly, I love a tool, why not? Um, and this is something that could be done as a pre-consultation screening tool, universally for sexual function as part of an intake form, waiting room materials, etc. So this one just says, Tell me about your sexual function in the past three months. Are you satisfied, yes or no? If no, then we get a little more information about what the issue is, and you can choose one or you can choose many. And what's the most bothersome issue? What should we, what's the thing that really is the problem that we need to address first and foremost? <laughs> and then do you wanna talk with your doctor about it? Specifically around sexual desire, this is a screening tool called the Decreased Sexual Desire Screener, which was developed by the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health, and focuses down on really sexual desire disorders. What was it like before? What is it now? Does it bother you? What do you feel might be contributing to this change and decrease in desire. And then it gives you a little scoring system to understand does this qualify as a diagnosis of HSDD? And this screening uh, tool has been validated. So that's a nice way to get uh, a clear approach to the diagnosis of HSDD. Now we've done our history, so what's our physical part of assessing for sexual dysfunction disorders? So history may suggest that this is not physical, you know, there, everything was normal, there has been a history of trauma, and now it's a psychological challenge around sexual health. Maybe we don't need an exam. But if history suggests an exam is needed, then these are the steps you definitely want to go through. Number one is an inspection of the external genitalia. We're looking at the skin color and texture. We're looking at the thickness. We're looking at the vaginal pH because these things can contribute to vaginal dryness, discomfort. Also, um, they can give us a sign of the vascularization of the genitalia, which is an important part of the excitement and arousal physiological changes. If there's reporting of dyspareunia or pain with any part of intercourse, we can do pain mapping, which is something that you would do for, you know, vestibulitis, etc. Just taking a cotton swab and tapping it over the portions of the vulva, the vaginal vestibule, the hymenal ring, and the other areas of the external genitalia that may be the source of tenderness. An internal exam is also going to help you evaluate for tenderness. Oftentimes this is in patients who report pain with deep penetration. Perhaps there's an adnexal mass there. You know, three months ago everything was fine and now for the last three months I've been having this sort of left-sided pain with intercourse. What's going on? We want to assess what's going on first with uh, a, a pelvic exam, and then a speculum exam can help give us a little more detail about the health of the vaginal mucosa. 
postmenopausal vaginal dryness is extremely common and is very treatable. And that's often one of the things that when addressed can really have a significant impact on patient's sexual health. So you want to uh, investigate all of these areas on your physical exam. Then there's laboratory studies that can be done. Again, if the history suggests it. If there are other associated symptoms that uh, women are having that might, you might think, oh, perhaps there's a thyroid issue here. Prolactin level is another thing that we know can affect the cycle of um, ovulation and the hormonal cycle is one of the things that drives sexual desire. If you are going to consider testosterone therapy, and again, we'll get to this in future webinars in much more detail, you'd want to look at a testosterone level and an SHBG level as well. And I think just to um, talk a little bit more about sort of the hormonal cycle and sexual desire. So when we look at some of the hormones for certainly some of the contraceptive hormones, and women on hormonal contraception, we see that there are differences in sexual frequency. There can be differences in sexual desire. There's nothing that's universally consistent, but each woman can be affected in many different ways. We know that the hormonal milieu around the time of ovulation increases our sexual desire in that time period because, you know, the body knows what it's doing. <laughs> Um, and suppressing that through contraceptive hormones, through GnRH agonists, et cetera, can flatten that response a little bit. But as we saw from the model, sexual health is multifactorial. And in fact, sometimes with women on contraception, we see that their sexual health or sexual satisfaction scores improve because they feel more free when having sex. So I think it's very important to do this thorough and of an evaluation, as well as eliciting the distress levels with the, of your particular patient to be able to focus a, um, an appropriate treatment plan. For HSDD in particular, the three mainstays of treatment are going to be psychotherapy, sexual therapy, and pharmacologic therapy. And again, we'll talk about these um, in the next webinar in much more detail. Okay, um, Neris, uh, I'm gonna ask for, uh, for you and I to comment on this, uh, this case presentation. I'll read it, but uh, I'd like to have a conversation about this. Um, so the case presentation is a 24-year-old graduate student uh, presents to a nurse practitioner, in my case, um, sometimes they present to me, uh, for a, but not for a well women visit, but, but present to me otherwise. Uh, last relationship ended uh, six months ago in a pre-visit screening questionnaire. I think they used the one that you, you spoke about earlier, nurse. She reports frustration and sadness that her interest in sex is negligible. What is your next step as a provider? Well, first of all, I'm very glad that she was screened. <laughs> so that's the number one thing, right? Because if you didn't ask, she w most likely would not have brought it up to you. So that's wonderful. You already have an assessment that this is distressing to her life. So now the next question for me would be, what is the issue, right? She's told me that there is an issue. She's told me that it's distressing. I have a sense that it's around interest in sex, but I want to get a little more detail on that. So I'd ask her to just describe the sexual problem that she feels she has in her own words. Okay. Well, let's take a look here at um, the next slide. So, Neris, you've taken uh, comprehensive sexual history. Yes, I'm getting the details to help. Getting the details, but she re but she reports no core uh, 
comorbid uh, medical conditions, medications, or current life stressors. Assuming that 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 um, that that's an accurate one, I from my perspective, I frequently find uh, patients are pretty poor historians when it comes to their their medication histories. Um, and um, and so uh, it's it's common for me anyway as I'm exploring the medication history, taking it the medication history not just from prescriptions their OBGYN may have given them, but primary care and maybe an endocrinologist and uh, um, um, whatever that um, there are there are drugs they may have been taken for years that they thought were were, were uh, without side effects, but now um, we we can begin talking about the fact that maybe maybe there there are some side effects here that are now um, rising up to the point of having this dysfunction. Mm. But in this in this case, she reports a history of sexual trauma during high school, a date rape that she has only revealed to a friend and is now revealed to you. So, uh, Neris, um this is what you have. Yeah, so I think you, you know, you've elicited that the problem is sexual desire, that it's distressing, it meets the criteria for something that you need to address. You've seen if there's any um, physiologic uh, issue that needs to be addressed that's contributing to this. Is there any physical uh, condition? Is there any medication? You've asked about the social issues that might contribute to this, any particular stress. She's a graduate student, you know, I might say, are you running up on your thesis right now? Is this any anxiety, any, um, you know, and then you've taken a sexual history um, that has elicited something that, um, you know, you opening that door with your screening has allowed her to disclose to a medical professional, which is going to be a, a you know a critical step that's going to help you and she move forward in addressing this as it pertains to her sexual health as well as it pertains to her general psychological health as well. <laughs> so in 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 my world, um, sometimes um, uh, Jen. Um, and I have start this conversation, and um, and so I'm actually at um, one of our clinics. Uh, the pharmacist actually administered the uh, pre-visit um, um, sexuality um, um, review. Um, so I had the patient fill it out and had it available. Um, so. Um, Sometimes the questions I get from uh, fellow pharmacists is, um, if if one doctor has written a prescription, let's say for a uh, antidepressant, should I refer this this woman, in this case Jen, back to the doctor who wrote that prescription, or should I refer her to an OBGYN who perhaps has not written that prescription? Yeah. What would you suggest we do? You know, I think that um, I would see if the patient has noted that the medication is a contributing factor, timing-wise, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, if this was a condition that existed prior to initiation of these medications, then I think our focus goes one way. Um, if this, yes, when I started taking this medicine, that's, you know, within those next months or so is when I started to notice this issue, then <clears throat> I think that um, that would be a focus of, of um, somewhere to start. And I would probably do both, to be honest. I mean, okay. I would say I think it does seem as though this medication may be a contributing factor. Mm -hmm. I want you to go back to your... Uh, whoever it was, your internist, your psychiatrist, yeah. to prescribe this and see if there's something else that might work for you that may not have this side effect. At the same time, I'm going to have you see a you know reproductive health professional so that they can look um, and see if there's any other 
etiologies or so that you can um, start down a road of, you know, sexual health therapy or whatever it might be that is going to resolve this issue. Yeah, I am. Um, thank you. I, um, I often take a clue. I mean, I always take a clue from the woman about who she would rather see. She may, she may have, a, a, and, and if she doesn't have a um, reproductive health professional that she's seeing, then I always keep handy a list of, of um, local reproductive health professionals who are taking new patients, who I think would be a good match with a given patient. So um, that's something certainly that, that pharmacists and others can do to make sure we match up her, her wishes with the best, uh, at least in my, in, in my opinion, the best providers available to her in our community. That sounds good. All right, I think we're coming to the end. We are. So I think we have one more slide. Don, I think you still have the... Uh... Yeah, it's, it's, there we go. So have you do the summary, Naris? Sure. So, you know, what we talked about the different models of the female sexual response, biopsychosocial, linear, and circular, to give you a framework to think about um, sexual dysfunction disorders. We also gave you the female sexual dysfunction definitions <coughs> around desire disorders, arousal disorders, orgasmic disorders, and pain disorders. And we focused a little bit down on specifically hyperactive sexual desire disorder. Um, which is decreased desire as well as personal distress about decreased desire. Do we have time for one question? Yes, thank you again, Naris and Don, for that excellent presentation. We do have time for one question, and it comes from Deborah, who asks, are statistics presented here on sexual disorders for women in heterosexual relationships only? <clears throat> the definition of hypo in relation to male partner standards or expectations, and how do you acknowledge or account for that in the definitions? Have there been similar data in women in lesbian relationships around satisfaction with level and frequency of arousal? And would a definition of HSDD change in this context? I think those are all incredibly important um, um, comments. And um, as I was reading through these, um, um, I had the same. I had the same questions. I'm not sure. Do are we addressing these in um, number two or three? Yes, we can certainly address them in the second webinar and also in our third frequently asked questions webinar. So. We do appreciate everyone taking the time to enter their questions. Yeah. The, I think the, the statistics on the frequency of uh, female sexual dysfunction, that is just a population-based survey. I don't know the breakdown of um, heterosexual or, or um, homosexual relationships or uh, self-declared status in that uh, survey of 31 plus thousand women, but I presume that it uh, was representative. I don't have, again, the, the way that it's broken down. Desire, though, go ahead. I, I, I don't have that breakdown either, and I think it, we, we need to explore that for um, remaining seminars here. For sure. And I think, but, you know, I think the good thing about the way that the definitions are laid out is that it is really the woman who is describing this as a problem for her. Now, interpersonal relationships is one aspect that goes into sexual health. So that's one of the things that you want to look at. And, uh, you know, Don talked about discordant desire between, that can be discordant between what you think you should be having frequency-wise and what you are and could be discordant between partners, what they think you should be having and what you would feel comfortable yeah. with. So those are going to be important aspects of the history to look into, but really it has to, it's only going to be considered a disorder by definition if the woman herself describes that this is 
personally dissatisfying and disruptive to her life. Perfect. Thank you so much. And the ARHP education team can also address this in more detail in our follow-up emails to everyone. So thank you again for uh, your presentation today, Naris and Don, and thank you to our participants for their excellent questions. Before our participants exit this webinar, we hope that they can take a moment to note the following. Please be sure to visit ARHP.org to register for the second and third webinars in this series, which will take place at 12 p.m. on Eastern Time on December 5th and December 12th. On December 5th, we will review female sexual health education, diagnosis, and treatment. And on the 12th, we will discuss frequently asked questions related to female sexual health. As a reminder, you will rec soon receive an email from ARHP's Education Department containing a link to the post-test survey. Your CME or CE certificate will be generated at the end of that survey. Please be sure to print the certificate before closing your internet browser. If you have questions, please email us at education at ARHP.org. Thank you again for taking the time to view this webinar. We hope you will take part in other live and on-demand ARHP-sponsored activities in the near future. Thank you.